Uh, welcome to the 17th in our series on the Middle East, uh, at Middle East and North Africa. Um, and what we're going to be covering today is the Islamization of Anatolia and the early Ottomans, right? So, all right. So for those of you who are familiar, my presentation is not an academic presentation. Um, and I am giving it from a secular perspective. Generally speaking, I'm not accredited in history, religion, or any of the topics that, we, that we're going to be discussing today. I just happen to be a lay person who's very interested in this. Um, as is typical, um, I will ask everybody to please be respectful. Uh, the class will be uh, 101 and a 201, meaning that um, if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up. And if you know something, I'll tell you something you didn't know before. Um, and of course, like all the other uh, entries into this series, it's a recording, which means that you can watch it later and discover uh, all the stuff that we've covered before. So as this is the 17th presentation, there are 16 in the past covering all the way from um, the beginning of Islam in the Middle East to the uh, to this point, which is now in the uh, 12 uh, in the 13th and 14th centuries. All right, and for those of you who have patiently endured last week's lesson, here is the quiz. Um, so question number one, which three of the following are titles that Timur Tamerlane used in reference to himself? Well, apparently he did, he did C. C is right. Um... Presumably, he did not call himself the Great Khan because he recognized the Great Khan in Beijing, or I would guess. He, he did not recognize the Great Khan in Beijing, but he didn't take that name because he's not a Chinggisid by blood. Right. Mm -hmm. He probably didn't call himself a Caliph because he was not descended from Muhammad. Mm -hmm. uh, correct. Now, to be clear, in Sunni Islam, you didn't have to be descended from Muhammad, but you had to be descended from Muhammad's Arabian tribe, Quraysh, okay, right? Yeah. Which, uh, which of course he wasn't. He was a turco mongol so he couldn't use the term caliph. Or Leia B. Sorry? Uh, F. Uh, F, he actually didn't use. Baylor Bay um, was a term that was often used by Turkish uh, yeah. warlords, but he didn't use that term. Um, the, the, the answers are the good again. Uh, he was the honored son-in-law to a Chinggisid. His wife uh, was, was a Chinggisid. Um, Sarai Mold Khanim, scourge, scourge of God, which Howard got, yep. um, was his way of placing himself in the negative position of Islamic theology. And Amir was his positive um, ah, association yeah. with Islam is that he called himself a prince. Hmm. All right. Well, Scourge of God, I remember reading us up on reading up on this on Attila the Hun, and mm -hmm. the implication was that he was doing God's work. Correct. And, that Christian, and then in the case of Attila the Hun, it was Christians that needed to be punished, that deserved to be punished. Exactly that, right? It's this idea that he is the divine punishment uh, from God. And so he took, and so Timur took that term from Attila the Hun. Hmm. And reapplied yeah. it in a Muslim context, right? Um, we saw that Chinggis. Right. Yeah, if you're a homicidal monster, people will come up with an explanation as to why you're. Uh, we'll try to explain if you're being virtuous about it. This is good. Right. <laughs> All right. Question number two Which of the following is an accurate description of Timur's relationship with Toktamish? Yeah, A is definitely true. A is the right answer. Well done, Greg. Yeah, so Toktamish was, uh, was exiled from the Blue Horde and Timur put him in power, um, but eventually um, the power got to his head, let's say, and um, he ended up uh, becoming Timur's greatest rival, invading his territory starting in 1385. Right. Um, B is false. The Muzaffarid dynasty in Iran did initially comply with Timur's conquest before starting a rebellion in Isfahan in 1387 that Timur crushed, killing between 100,000 and 200,000. Uh, but Toktamish was just not the leader of that dynasty. Um, again, C is also true, but Toktamish was not the person 
who was the Sarbardar commander. And D um, is also true, but not for Totemish. Uh, that was Suyur Ghatamish, who was the um, Shagatai uh, Chinggisid um, that Timur, quote, served, end quote, um, despite uh, that Chinggisid prince basically being Timur's puppet. All right, question number three. Which of the following are places that Timur attacked and sacked? Uh, choose all that apply. And was Baghdad even sackable at that time? Absolutely. Um, he definitely got, he definitely did Delhi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, in terms of your question, Baghdad was absolutely sackable at that time because after Huligu Khan destroyed it in 1258, um, he then sent people to rebuild the city and repopulate it. Um, mm -hmm. And a number of the Ilkhans had done the same so that by the time that Timur conquered it in 1393 for the first time, because he had to keep conquering it, um, he was yeah. able... Uh, Sarai it, it, it Berkin, he did not attack that. He did, actually. He did? Uh, <laughs> The irony is that all of these are correct answers. Yep, they're all. Um, uh, <laughs> I was waiting for you, Aaron. Yeah, all all of these eight cities, among many others, are ones that uh, Timur sacked. Uh, I think it's 11... 90, 96 or ninety three, some number like that. That's the total yeah. Number. That's exactly right. It's it's in the it's in the nineties. So Aleppo was taken in fourteen hundred. Ankara was taken in fourteen o two. Baghdad, the sack occurred in 1401. There were, as I said, there were three different invasions. The sacking occurred in 1401. Delhi was 1398. Isfahan was in 1387. Sarai Berke was, I want to say, in 1392. Um, uh, Izmir was in 1402. Uh, Tbilisi was in 1386. So no, no more Golden Horde, no more Blue or White Horde, Ray? No, actually, when uh, Toktamish was defeated, um, and, yeah. yeah, so and then you're right. He invaded and sacked the city, but then he appointed a puppet who would run the Golden Horde for him. So uh, it seems that Timur never had interest in taking the territory of the Golden Horde, uh, but he wanted an allied leader who would be in command there. So even though he took Surai Berke, which was the capital of the Golden Horde, he didn't actually uh, rule over it. All right, question number four. Which of the following is an accurate description of the intellectual and artistic situation in Samarkand and its environs? Like we're talking about, about modern Uzbekistan in the 15th century. I think D applies. Uh, which one? D. Uh, B is... Uh, D, 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 for, D. Uh, D. A number of scientists, etc. Yeah, uh, Greg, Greg is correct. The right answer is D. Um, B did move the capital to Herat, but the, most of the artists stayed in Samarkand. Uh, there were some that came to Herat, but the majority stayed in Samarkand. Samarkand was really the center of the Timurid Renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, the other ones are just false on their face. Um, yeah, uh, question number five. Which of the following is an accurate description of what happened in Western Iran after the death of Timur? Um, basically, the answer is B, right? The black sheep Turks were able to consolidate their position in Western Iran. And then suddenly the black sheep Turks were defeated by the white sheep Turks um, who held uh, almost all of Iran um, until the Safavids uh, conquered them uh, from Anatolia. Um, the other ones are general are, are false. Um, in, uh, C is false because uh, of the timeline, the Safavia um, didn't defeat uh, the white sheep Turks until uh, the uh, until 1501. So it wasn't immediately after Timur's death, it was a century later. And uh, D is false because Uzun Hassan was an enemy of the Ottomans um, and was coordinating with the Venetians an alliance against the Ottomans. All right. So I'm going to do something a little bit different today than, than what I typically do and sort of start with a discussion topic because 
uh, that's really relevant to what we're going to talk about today. And so you have this situation that occurs when one empire from region A conquers another people in region B, right? Uh, you have a relationship between those two ethnic groups and how uh, the change occurs over, over time. So there are sort of five ways, um, if I can boil it down, that this will go historically, right? The first one is assimilationism that I'm, I'm calling it, which is where, you know, you have these invaders, they come in and they see the civilization that they've conquered and they become very similar to the civilization that they conquer. Uh, it's that the people who, who they've conquered really make an impact on them and change their culture, right? And we've seen this before, right? We saw this when the Mongols conquered Persia. There's very little Mongolishness in the way that they ran their empire in terms of the customs that they brought to Persia, right? And we talked about this and how the Mongols conquered Persia. We talked about this in, in a number of different cases where the conqueror just sort of vanishes, right? And we've seen that before with the, per with the Mongols. We've seen that with a number of other groups. But that's not the only way that this can go, right? Replacement system is this idea that the original group that was in the territory that would be conquered um, basically got replaced by the new incoming entity, right? And it's usually because there's some kind of genocide or massacre or large scale famine, something that leads to this population just disappearing off the map. Um, and a perfect example of this is when the English colonists reached the Eastern, what we now call the United States, right? You had all these native tribes that lived there, the English arrive and they massacre um, all the people who were there. And then there's only English people left, right? There are some Native Americans who survived, but the number of Native Americans who survived is so small that the, uh, the majority population effectively doesn't have to really think about them or consider them. So that's replacementism, right? Then you have something like um, called integration that I'm calling integrationism, which is where the Invading group is of a certain size and the local group is of another certain size and they're able to intermarry um, and create some sort of hybrid culture, right? So for example, you've seen the way that in the formation of England, you had the Danes, the Vikings, the Celts and the Romans, these four different groups had invaded at different periods in time and somehow all created English society as sort of a, uh, as sort of a society of equals in that sort of sense where each group became a participant in the creation of the English identity. Those groups was the dominant force in the creation of the English identity. Something new came out of the intermarriage between all these different groups. That's not to say that, that there weren't periods where, for example, the Danes were in power, or the Vikings were in power, but that the cultural identity that resulted was not a Danish, Viking, Celtic, or Roman identity, but something entirely new that resulted from that interaction. The next one is what I'm calling conversionism which is where the invading force is small, but the local population slowly begins to take on the cultural behaviors of the conqueror, right? This is the opposite of assimilationism, right? Where the invader, to, uh, in assimilationism, the invader took on the aspects of the conquered people. In this case, the conquered people take on the aspects of the invader, and they begin to conceive of themselves as the invading party, right? They, they don't see themselves as having been the conquered people. They see themselves as being part of the invaders, even though historically that's not true, right? That they begin to convert to that mentality. And finally, the last one is uh, what I'm going to call sectarianism, which is where the invaders don't eliminate the in, uh, indigenous population, uh, and they don't try to culturally convert them either. They consider them as a separate entity, so they don't integrate with them either. Um, so the two groups sort of exist in parallel, and now there may be power disparities between them, but it's never that one group disappears and the other group replaces them. These two groups exist side by side in very clearly delineated patterns. And the example I chose here was apartheid uh, South Africa um, becoming modern South Africa, right? Um, it's not that blacks and whites replaced each other, in fact, during the, uh, during the apartheid period, there was a growth in the black population. Um, it happened that these, and, but the whites never tried to convince blacks that they were secretly white and vice versa, right? These two groups maintained functional independence uh, from each other. So these are the sort of interactions that, we, that we're going to see, right? Over the course of empire building. 
when it comes to what happened in Anatolia, we can remove assimilationism and uh, sectarianism from our discussion, um, primarily because assimilationism doesn't make sense. Assimilationism doesn't make sense because the Turks who invade become the dominant cultural entity, right? So it wouldn't make sense to say that the Turkish identity was lost because that's exactly what survived to the present day, right? Um, and became the dominant population in Anatolia within a few centuries of the invasion. So assimilationism doesn't fit. And sectarianism doesn't fit because we do have a large degree of intermarriage between uh, Turkish people and the indigenous population of Anatolia, which I'm going to call Rome uh, for, for the sake of clarity, right? We have a lot of relationships between Turks and Rome. We have the the we know that room converted to, uh, to Islam. So there's not this strict border between these two different ethnic groups. Um, so we really narrow it down to these sort of three, right? And I'm curious, um, this process was called Turkification or in Turkish Turkleştirme, um, the becoming Turkish. And it was very similar to the Arabization that we've seen in earlier presentations concerning the creation of Arab ethnicity in the Levant, uh, Mesopotamia, and in Egypt. So I would like to sort of open it up to the floor and ask if people have opinions on whether they think that what was what's going to happen, what we're going to discuss today is some kind of replacementism, some kind of integrationism, or some kind of conversionism, or a mix of these, and how they sort of, what their intuitions are. I think it's uh, <clears throat> convers uh, conversionalism the most, and then maybe a little bit of uh, integ uh, integrationism. Sure. That's, can you sort uh, of can you sort of work through why you why you feel it's that way? Well, conversionalism. Uh, I, I think that uh, ethnically, uh, uh, Turks are are not a uh, dominant uh, group in the, in Anatolia at all. Uh, <clears throat> so they, uh, but the Turks feel uh, as Turks, uh, ethnically, uh, they, they have sense of, uh, patriotism and, uh, strong, uh, so, you know, feel of, uh, motherland and defending it. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think they also kind of absor absorbed. And uh, there are many other cultures uh, in that area that would be integrationalism a part of it is that um, they kind of uh, blend it in with uh, some other cultures uh, as well, uh, but not all. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, mostly it's more of a, a conversionism uh, and a little bit of also integrationism, but not replacentism. That's my idea. Yeah, I, I would agree mm -hmm. with Greg. I think it's mostly conversionism. I guess the language, of course, is Turkish, which is a Turkic language. I suppose in the Byzantine, well, uh, I mean, it, I suppose it depends on what you mean by before. I guess maybe the Seljuk Turks may have brought in Turkish language before the, um, but the indigenous, but Turkey, Turkish is not an indigenous language in Anatolia. I suppose maybe it was Greek speaking in the uh, Byzantine Empire. So the, the language has become fully Turkish and the religion is pretty much fully Turkish. Um, so whether there are other elements that are more indigenous, I don't know. <clears throat> no, that, that, th those are really sort of great uh, questions and answers. Um, Howard, I, I think that you wanted to say something. I was going to ask you, how, how different, were, in a cultural sense, how different are the Seljuk Turks and the Turks under Tamerlane? Okay, it's easier to say that Tamerlane was not leading an exclusive coalition. That is to say that the majority of his, uh, of his coalition was not Turks. They were Mongolic Shakatai people. Um, when there, there were Turkic tribes that also came with Tamerlan, but actually this Turkification that we're talking about was occurring prior to Tamerlan. This is sort of the difficulty of the way that the lessons are, are structured. Um, this time period that we're in right now is roughly analogous to before Shingis Khan, like just before Shingis Khan um, entered uh, into the scene 
um, is when we're starting this turkeyfication process. And this turkeyfication process will occur through much of the 13th century, right? So that's the period of of uh, uh, of the Ilkhanate, right? So that by the time that you have, for example, Ghazan converting to Islam uh, in the late uh, 13, uh, in the late 1200s, most of uh, Anatolia become roughly equal in terms of Christian Muslim population, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time that Tamerlane is showing up in the beginning of the 1400s, um, he's arriving at an Eastern Turkey, at least, that is majority Muslim. Um, we don't have census data until the next century, but uh, in the 1526 census, um, there is a sharp Muslim majority in most provinces of Eastern what's now Turkey. So that, that's why there's this question, right? And it's a very uh, charged political question in Turkey today. Um, when it comes to replacementism, um, I wanted to highlight that Ralph was right, that uh, Turkish is not an indigenous language to the Anatolian Peninsula, and it came through the Seljuk invasions. Um, and there is a core of ultra-nationalists on both the Turkish side and the Greek slash Armenian side that say that the Turkish invasion was a replacementist invasion, right? That the Turks replaced the indigenous population with Turks to the steppe, which is why the people speak Turkish and um, eat uh, foods that are typically Turkish with the exception of fish, right? Fish was obviously not existent in Central Asia. Um, so, their view, right, of course, is that from the Turkish perspective, the ultranationalists that hold to this view hold to it because it means that Turkey is their creation, right? They have, they owe anything to the indigenous people of Anatolia because the indigenous people of Anatolia are basically irrelevant um, in the creation of modern Turkey. And from the Greek Armenian side, they hold to it, uh, those who hold to it, hold to it from an ultranationalist perspective because it means that they are entirely the victims of this imperial Turkish power, which, uh, which through the act of massacring and controlling the population, um, destroyed them, right? Um, but Richard, and uh, but then it also, it only happened in the 20th century then, right? Not, not before, right? Well, no. The, in the, the war, who... a part of the World War I, uh, because, sure. because sure. before there was uh, major communities of Greeks and uh, Armenians there, right? Yeah, no, basically the argument that they would make is that there was a first wave of violence and attacks. Both, both of the, the sides that argue that replacementism is true will say that in the beginning there was a wave of attacks, which you have to realize the population of Anatolia when the Seljuks invaded was around 8 million people. The Seljuk were several tens of thousands. So if you want to create a replacementist scenario, you have to have waves of eliminations, not just the single elimination of the genocide in World War I. Um, I have a comment that uh, in the chat room that uh, this is very political and needs to be contextualized. Absolutely. And that's what I'm going to talk about when we go through the history about what what actually happened and what's going on. But I want to sort of point these, these sort of waves out because this is of course a very controversial part of history. And I want to expose my own biases and, and way of handling this. Uh, we can make your own decisions as to how the story I'm telling you is actually history or it isn't. Um, my intuition tracks much more closely, though, with where Greg and Ralph are coming from, which is that it was mostly conversionism um, and to a lesser degree integrationism. You see a lot more integrationism, for example, I would say in Azerbaijan than you do in Anatolia, um, simply because the population was too large in terms of disparity um, for it to be an equal marriage um, of Turks and Rum. But um, those who argue on the conversionist side tend to be those who support some kind of reconciliation between Turks and the Christian minorities that were persecuted in the 20th century. Um, the idea, the underlying idea here would be that, oh, fuck, seriously. Mm -hmm. 
Did you lose me? No. Nope. Oh, okay. So now I just swore I needed to. Um, okay, but <laughs> it gives you more color there, uh, Richard. It, it, we, we get the other side of you. Uh, Thank Richard, you. Richard. Um, now I'm I'm a little confused about the term room. Um, this because room was the uh, was the Seljuk Sultanate of room as opposed to the previous indigenous people before the Turks, I guess before the Turks arrived, they were Christian and I guess Greek speaking up until 1100 or therefore, until the, until the conquests of the Seljuks? Yeah, so um, the reason the Seljuk Sultanate was called the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome was because the Seljuks who ruled there considered this to be part of the Roman Empire, right? That had been their experience of Anatolia, was that it was part of Rome. And so they called themselves the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome, meaning Anatolia, right? Because that's where they were ruling from. But, they, but the term Rome, when they applied it internally within the empire, and the Ottomans did the same, that term became used for the Greek population, the Greek speaking population that had historically been citizens of the Roman Empire, right? So that's that's where that term is being used. Um, so if you, for example, look at Ottoman registration documents um, from the 14th century onwards, they'll list the religions as Muslim and the second largest religion as Rum, being the Greek Orthodox Church, but they consider them Rum because they are the Roman people of Anatolia. Does that sort of clarify it? Uh, I guess just to so just to simple. So Rum means Greek speaking Christians? Yes. Isn't okay. it coming from the name of from the Rome? Yes. Exactly, coming from Rome. Mm -hmm. Right? Because from the Turkish perception, right, this was the Byzantine Empire, this was Rome. So mm -hmm. they they eventually discovered like the actual Rome in Italy. Um, but by that point the term Rum had sort of stuck and it became their sort of perception. Um, N.A., um, you mentioned that you uh, had recently been to Turkey. How does that color your perception of this? Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I, I don't have a great connection. But yeah, I would just say that uh, it's very political because of, of, of maybe not what, what, what has always gone on, but more so what's gone on later with Ataturk and, and the kind of creation of a Turkish identity out of you know this of the mythology and such that they drew upon and so you can see that it's it's very very political and how how all of this is viewed not only by the groups um either separatists or neighboring groups but the religious groups in turkey and the, so it's 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 very interesting and even within different parts of society the secularists and the religious people i mean it's a very 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 complicated and and um i mean i don't really know if uh, objective history can even be done because i don't know the scholarship on it but you could see that with like people in the military for instance they have one view a kind of like at a turk kind of view and you know religious people have a different view and you know different minority groups the kurds have their own view and you know and there's all these different people unlikely <laughs> you know when you travel there you don't realize and the christians i was spent a lot of time in the east and those early churches and those monasteries along the Syrian border, and so it's it's uh, it's very interesting, you know, that the you know the view the Christians have, and so so it's really it's just a very complex dynamic. I, you know? I I think I think that's brilliant, and and I again I wanted to sort of bring this up to show the political variation in sort of this analysis, and so I'm going to take you down what I think my analysis is, but I want to let, I wanted to make it clear that that it's not so. Uh, clear from a political and historical perspective. It's exactly like trying to map the Bible to history, right? It's uh, everybody's going to approach it from their own very sort of charged uh, perspective. I also wanted to comment a little bit on what you mentioned in the chat, which is that you bumped into a number of Aramaic being Christians. That would be the Assyrian minority that also existed uh, within uh, within the uh, within Anatolia and with within northern Mesopotamia, which is another Christian group. All right, so if we remember from our previous times, what we saw when uh, 
we sort of brushed up against it when we talked about the Third Crusade, when uh, Frederick Barossa, uh, the king of the Holy uh, Roman Empire, came through in 1190, and he defeated the Seljuks here, but eventually uh, the Seljuks were able to recover the territory. We also saw that the makeup of Anatolia shifted uh, quite substantially after the Fourth Crusade, right? You had these Venetian Crusaders who came to Constantinople in 1204, sorry, 1202, 1204, and created what was called the Francocratia, or the Latin Empire. Um, that Latin Empire really divided the Byzantine Empire into those areas on the western side of it, like the Despotate of Epirus, the Duchy of Athens, uh, Morea, and those on the eastern side, like the Empire of Nicaea, right? Um, eventually, the Empire of Nicaea would conquer back the Latin Empire. But the Francocratia, or the Latin Empire, Francocratia is just the Greek word meaning rule of the Franks, right? It really changed the relationship between the Byzantine Empire and the Seljuks. Because previous to this point, the Seljuks had basically been constantly running up against Byzantine military threats. and um, the two of them had been incredibly antagonistic. The Francocratia with the Latin Empire um, splitting uh, the Byzantine Empire apart, Byzantine concerns became much more concerned with retaking Constantinople and the territory controlled by the Latin Empire than it was with the Seljuks. And the Seljuks and they had to have um, much better relations, especially as Seljuk mercenaries started being employed by the Empire of Nicaea uh, to bolster their ability um, to field troops in battle. Um, I wanted to respond also a little bit to some of the comments in the chat. Um, absolutely, the, con the concept of Turkishness is something that developed uh, in the 20th century. Um, the Ottoman Empire delineated people by uh, religion, not so much by ethnicity. Um, so uh, that's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a little more complicated like that. And we're going we're gonna to get into it. Um, over the course of uh, this series. So if we look at the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome as a historical um, thing, we see that it's based in the city of Konya. On this map, Konya is identified as Iconio. Um, and you can see that the Seljuk Sultanate starts around Konya and begins to expand. And that expansion really is helped by the collapse of the Byzantine Empire, or rather the weakening of the Byzantine Empire by the Francocratia, as we saw before, right? And so the double-headed eagle of the Seljuk Sultanate really expands. Um, their biggest gains really were those northern and southern um, waterfront uh, positions. In Sinope, um, they built a large Black Sea fleet. And in Antalya, you can see the picture in the lower right-hand side where they built uh, Kizilkulesi, the um, the red tower that overlooks the, the harbor at Alanya um, and really allowed the Turks to begin uh, having a naval position in the Mediterranean. But what really brought wealth and prestige to the Seljuk Sultan was the creation of a caravanserai. You can see one um, in the upper right hand side. We sort of talked about this a little bit, but it's very important to really stress it today. The caravanserai brought in a lot of wealth from the east, and it also brought in a lot of from Persia, which resulted in the Seljuk Sultans creating a blueprint of using Persian bureaucrats who had been imported uh, from uh, Iran to govern the territories of the Seljuk Sultanate. Um, as we've sort of discussed language, right, when the Seljuks arrived in Anatolia, they were speaking a very, um, I don't know what you want to say, pure form of Turkish. Um, and by the time that they had worked with these Persian administrators for decades, Persian words became part and parcel of the Turkish language um, because of how deeply indebted the Persian government was, sorry, the, uh, the Seljuk government was to its Persian bureaucrats. Um, we even have the point where Seljuk sultans start taking on Persian names. We see, for example, on the right hand side, a Sultan Kehosro. Kehosro was a Persian name referring to a mythological king um, in Persian history. And so the use of this name was signaling that the Seljuks were in line with this higher enlightened Persian culture. Now that's not to say that they didn't use uh, Byzantine aristocrats from time to time, but the Persians made up the dominant uh, governing basis.
this period, as this really expanded across Anatolia, they were dealing with a Christian population that really hadn't been spiritually fed, for want of a better term, from Constantinople in at least a few generations. You had a number of churches that were breaking down and empty and, um, and the religious experience that a lot of Christians had from especially illiterate priests was not very um, exciting or desirable. And at the same time, because of the Mongol invasions um, of Eastern Iran, especially, but also uh, increasingly of Western, you Sufi saints and leaders move from Iran into the Sanjuk Sultanate and begin to teach there, right? One of the most famous was Jalal al-Din. Um, Jalal al-Din uh, came from the city of Balkh, which is in modern day, um, I want to say Afghanistan. It's either Afghanistan or Uzbekistan. Um, but uh, from Balkh, uh, uh, Chinggis Khan um, uh, attacked the city. And uh, who was a leader. Now, Jalal al-Din had grown up actually as somebody who was much more dogmatic. Uh, he grew up as a faqih, uh, a legal Islamic jurist. But when he met Divan Shams, he became converted to Sufism in the sense of that was his new uh, discipline and way of engaging with the world. Sufism has become part and parcel of the Turkish experience. Um, yeah, uh, as as has been noted in the comments, uh, Jalal al-Din only wrote in Farsi. Um, almost all of his uh, almost all of his uh, work is in Farsi, but you can see even with that language difference, uh, he was still incredibly influential in Turkey. Um, but what makes Sufism unique, as I was saying earlier, is that Sufism is based on an emotional um, response to the act of prayer, the act of connection. It's about feeling a love connection with reality in the way that it is, much more than it is the stringent following of guidelines. That said, there are a number of required practices and rhythmic actions and rites that Sufis undertake to establish that love connection, to establish that kind of relationship. And his successors founded what was called the Medlana, which was one of several tariqat, uh, of orders of the Sufis. Um, so one of the things that Jalal al-Din Arumi was very famous for was from going from town to town and he would bring the Sufi saints that followed him, um, the, the, sorry, the Sufi students that followed him uh, to perform dances for the people. And I use the word dance in quotes because in reality, these were ritualistic rhythmic actions that were designed to promote um, a sense of religious and spiritual connection. You can see one of those quote dances on the right hand side, that's the whirling dervishes. Um, and that is the key signature of the Bethlehem movement is these whirling dervishes. The way that they cock their head, the speed of their movements, it's incredibly entrancing, but it is reflective of their religious experience connecting to the oneness that is God. And many of the Christians who saw this were entranced by it as well, just as we are in the modern day. And they began to connect to these, uh, to these Sufis in a way that they were not connecting to the leaders of the churches where they were, who were generally speaking, as I said, illiterate and under-equipped. You also saw in Anatolia the increasing desire of people to see spirituality beyond just these dances, which became the respect for the tombs of saints. You can see, for example, in the middle, you have uh, the Yeshil Turbe, or the green, uh, or the green uh, burial chamber. I don't know how you would translate Turbe. Um, uh, the green tomb, maybe, um, which is where Jalal al-Din was buried in Konya. Um, and Jalal al-Din, like other Sufi saints, would receive pilgrims who would come to visit him. And it wouldn't just be Muslims or people considering Islam that would visit uh, the Yeshid Turbe. You would also have 
Jews and Christians who were very secure in their own faiths, visiting him as sort of this leader in respecting the unity of God, in loving people, in loving reality. Um, and they wanted a little bit of that connection. So you could see uh, there were cases where the Mevlana would show up with Jalal din to a small town and the entire town would just convert to Islam. Um, there are other cases where it did not uh, work as magically as that, but that was definitely part of the Islamization process. You also see the developments of other Sufi disciplines. Now, Jaladin was on the Sunni side of the divide. Uh, when we look at somebody like um, uh, Haji Bektashvali, um, he's on maybe more the Shiite side of the divide. Um, and uh, Bek and Bektash, uh, sorry, does somebody want to say something? All right. Uh, so Bektash um, also came from Iran and was also expelled during the Mongol conquests, but he had a much stronger conviction um, in the primacy of Ali and the veneration of Ali. Um, and to many Turks in the, uh, sorry, to many Turks and many locals in the eastern part of Anatolia and the western part of the South Caucasus, this sort of veneration of Ali made more sense to them. They already held Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib, right, the, the Shiite successor to Muhammad, in a more venerable position. And they liked the idea of his virtues and piety and celebrating that in a way that a lot of the Sunnis did not. Um, and so when Bektash Vali really elevated the position of Ali in his proselytization, especially to soldiers, um, like the Sipahi, you can see above, a lot of them converted to his tariqa, which was the Bekteshi movement. Um, and they became Sufis in his way. Now, his capital was further east of Ankara in a place called Haji Bektash, in comparison to Jalal din who made his capital in Konya, right? In terms of where he started, and Konya is, to the, is much further to the west of Ankara. So just to get sort of an idea about where these groups are. And you can see the Haji Bektash Kriya Yassir uh, in the upper left-hand side, um, which is the center of the Bektashi movement. Now, Bektashi are Shiite Sufis uh, well within the borders of Islam, but there were a number of people who idolized Bektash and several of his successors to the point where they stepped to the edge, if not over the line of the Islamic fold. And those are the Alibi. And the Alibi tend to have their own centers of worship that they call Jemavi. And you can see a picture of a Jemavi in the center. So the Alibi faith, because um, I, I consider Alibi um, to be a post-Islamic religion. There are there, there is an immense amount of debate as to whether Alibi are or are not a post-Islamic religion, um, whether they're within the fold of Islam or not. And um, you can see in the center is something very similar to a whirling dervish um, because of the Sufi origins of Alevism. Um, and the Alevi um, meet in this Jemavi, which is their own house of worship. They don't worship in mosques, they worship in Jemavi. Um, and they venerate Ali and Muhammad as two sides of the same prophetic coin, that they represent the attributes that every Alevi should try to emulate. Unfortunately, and I have to bring this up because of modernity, um, Alevis have suffered under modern discrimination under the Republic of Turkey. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, this is graffiti from October of 2020 um, in an Alevi neighborhood uh, in Istanbul. And it says Alevi der Ölim, which is Turkish for uh, uh, die Alevis. Um, and it was spray painted on the side of an Alevi apartment. This is not common, but it's not rare either. Um, and Alevis have been subject to legal discrimination in the sense that their Jemavis are not recognized as official religious centers. Richard, are the Alevis the same as the Alawites in Syria of the uh, Assad regime? No, it's actually a different, uh, a different, okay. uh, yeah. The, uh, the Alawites uh, in, in Syria are 
a religion that sort of fuses elements of Gnostic Christianity with, um, with elements of uh, Shiite uh, Islam from the Twelver school. Um, so that, for example, um, Alawites will celebrate uh, Christmas and Easter, they'll drink wine um, and a number of other things that would not put them within the Islamic fold. Alevi, on the contrary, they do drink wine, but they but it's not it's not a part of the religion in the way that it is for for Alawites, um, and they definitely don't celebrate Christmas or Easter. So it's a, it, there are two different faiths. I would consider both of them post-Islamic religions. Um, so uh, thank you for the comment. Um, all right. So you have this real massive discussion and development of religion going on uh, in uh, the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome uh, during the middle of the 13th century, right? We talked about Jalal al-Din Rumi, we talked about Haji Bakhtashvali. Um, we also have uh, people coming from the West um, and by West, I mean Andalusia. Because remember during the 1100s and 1200s, Andalusia still had um, a, an Islamic portion to it. And coming from the Almohad uh, Caliphate was Ibn al-Arabi, uh, who also taught in Konya. And to as best as we can tell, um, his uh, disciples met with uh, Jalal al-Din Rumi in Konya. We also, uh, we also saw the creation of numerous mosques in Konya. And Konya became venerated as a holy and sacred city. In fact, in modern Turkey today, Konya remains sort of the center of historic um, sorry about that all right um, in the modern in the modern city of Konya um, it still is the holy center of Turkey and there is a lot of both religious uh, orientation, uh, like a religiously oriented uh, Turks consider Konya the center of the country, not Istanbul or Ankara. Um, and there's a lot of pressure from those who are more religious in orientation to sort of see the Ottomans as a derailing of Turkish history because they moved the capital away from Konya. They moved the center of the Islamic world uh, in Turkey away from Konya. But there's a couple things that I wanna point to um, in terms of the development of Konya and its organization. The first thing is that if you look at the Alauddin Kaikobad Mosque that I have in the upper left-hand side, and you focus on the area in the foreground, you notice that the mosque is actually a box in shape. It's square, uh, and, it, and the dome in the back is actually a more modern uh, addition, uh, much later than the original construction of the mosque. So you can see that the mosque actually has a flat roof, and as I said, has that sort of square rectilinear uh, shape. Um, if you look in the picture in the center, you can sort of see inside what that mosque looks like. And you can, and this is actually very typical of what a Seljuk Turk mosque would look like. It would be a lot of pillars holding up the roof, uh, holding up the roof that, and the roof is held up by a number of arches. The mihrab or the prayer area is in the center. And it was made to facilitate prayer, right? Everybody could enter um, and praying was very easy. The construction was very, uh, was very simple. Um, and uh, that would be it. Um, Konya was also a center of banking and, and uh, economic development uh, because you had all of these caravanserai, these um, hotels for travelers along the Silk Road, these caravanserai, um, like Zaza Dinhana that you can see below, you began to develop a huge economic engine out of Konya um, to process and pay for all of these incoming goods. You also had the development uh, of palaces run by these, um, run by uh, the, the Seljuk Sultans. And you can see, if you look closely at the tile work, that the tiles show actual human beings in various states of action, right? You have ones that are, um, uh, ones that are uh, going through grain, whole, uh, shooting arrows, all different kinds of things. Now, if we remember from some of our earlier discussions or what you may know outside of this, uh, outside of this group, um, 
there is a strong prohibition in Sunni Islam of depicting humans. But during this very holy period, uh, the Seljuk sultans were living in this sort of Sufi syncretic room situation. Um, it was perfectly normal uh, to depict human beings. And that was part and parcel of the artistic and cultural flourishing of Konya, uh, the holiest city of Anatolia. I also wanted to respond to in the chat, um, the Haji Bakhtash Valley has Star of Davids, but in many cases, those Star of Davids are not Jewish religious symbols. Uh, the the six-pointed star is very common in Islamic um, iconography as well. So we also mentioned from uh, the Western side, uh, sorry, from the Eastern side that uh, the Chinggisids were pushing the Khwarezm Shah, um, into uh, the area controlled by the Sanjuk Turks into Rum. And we mentioned how Jalaluddin uh, Magburni, the last uh, leader of the Khwarezm Shah, um, ended up fighting uh, a coalition of Seljuks, Ayyubids, and Abbasids uh, in the Battle of Yasichaman in 1230. Um, and the Khwarezm Shah was defeated uh, in that battle and was killed uh, soon afterwards by Chon Makan um, and, uh, and his Mongol forces. Now, Chon Makan, uh, his initial interactions with the Seljuk Sultan were rather funny. Um, basically, the Seljuk Sultan um, uh, came to the courts of Chon Makan demanding compensation for several losses that he had suffered. And Chon Makan said, no, no, no. This goes the other way around. You pay tribute to the Mongols. And they're like, Mongol who? Um, and that did not end very well for the Seljuk Sultanate. So Chormakan had some initial interactions, but after they received uh, payment, the Seljuk Sultan was more or less left alone uh, while Chormakan was there, which is in the 1230s and the beginning of the 1240s. During this period, you had an attempt by the Seljuk sultans to uh, control more of uh, the areas in Eastern Anatolia. And in so doing, they ended up brushing against early Alevis and a number of other Muslims, at least in name, um, who began to exhibit the kind of cultish behavior that we associate with millenarian movements. And these millenarian uh, Muslim movements centered around the name by the name um, a man by the name of Baba Ishaq. Now, Baba Ishaq um, sort of created a syncretic mixing of Turkic historic beliefs, things like the evil eye, um, the the Khamsa, uh, veneration of the sky, and he melded them with his version of Islam. And so he was Richard, able to, yeah. Richard, can I, can I go back a bit? Um, Around 1100 at the time of the Crusades, which is sort of a good reference point for me, the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum was pretty much independent of the Seljuk Empire uh, in where? Mesopotamia, Persia? Exactly. Was that still true in this period? This is Absolutely. We're talking, when we talk about Seljuks here, we're talking about Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, quite independent. The Seljuk Empire of the East still exists. No. The Seljuk Sultanate of the uh, the Seljuk Sultanate of the East, the Great Seljuk Empire, um, was destroyed by the Khwarezmians in the eleven in eleven seventy three. So by this point, we're in the twelve hundreds. Um, the eastern part of the empire is now controlled by the Mongols. And the western part was run by the Khwarezm Shah uh, until he was defeated. And right, and then we talk, talked about that entire collapse, which led to the Abdiguzids and the Georgians and all of these other wars that were going on in the eastern theater um, of, Anat like east of Anatolia, west of central Iran, which was controlled very, very strongly by uh, the Mongols, right? Um, because if we remember, the Mongols had three successive invasions, right? They had the so invasion of... The Seljuk Sultanate of Rum is what remains. Yes, the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum is the only Seljuk uh, country that exists at this point in time. Good, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so this is between, this is during the second Mongol wave, because the first Mongol wave was under Shingis Khan, the second Mongol wave uh, going westward was under Chomakan and, and Baijun Noyan, which is the period that we're in, which was from 1230s to 1240s. And then the third one was under Huligu Khan um, in the 1250s and 1260s, right? So, so we're in the middle of the second Mongol wave, but since we're in Anatolia, we're somewhat removed uh, from the strongest of the Mongol reactions, right? So, um, so in 1240, Baba Ishaq becomes this sort of cult leader um, using his um, uh, familiarity with uh, Turkic uh, nomadic customs, creating a syncretic religion that allows for the drinking of wine. He leads a nomadic insurrection against um, the Seljuks. And you can see by the map in the lower right-hand side, with the red being territories taken by Baba Ishaq, and the purple being areas that remained under Seljuk control, he controlled about the eastern half of the empire before um, in the latter part of 1240 and the early part of 1241, um, he was put down. But this should show you one of the themes that we're going to see, which is that the east tends to be a little bit more Turkic, a little bit more religious, and tends to be uh, operating in opposition to the centralizing efforts from the areas to the west. Now this is now we mentioned this from the Mongol side, but now we're going to see it from the Seljuk side. So in 1243, um, Baijun Oyan, uh, who was a Mongol leader, um, ended uh, went to the Seljuks to demand their tribute, which they hadn't delivered, and the Seljuks refused to pay. So Baijun Oyan uh, attacked them, and he, and he attacked them at what was called Kuzadag or Hairy Mountain. And you can see a picture of that mountain um, in the center. Now, Kuzadag is in what's now Eastern Turkey. Um, and it was a battle where the Seljuk Sultan gathered to him all forces that he could at his disposition. He had Frankish mercenaries, he had Byzantine uh, soldiers, he got Georgians to fight as well. Um, even though the Georgians were supposed, uh, like Georgian mercenaries, because the Georgian government was allied with Baijun Oyan. Um, and he got people from Trebizond. He tried to get people from every um, place to try and hold back Baijun Oyan. And the Mongols thrashed him. Um, his empire was effectively destroyed and the whole thing became part of the Mongol empire. Now it is true, and we're going to see this, that the Seljuk Empire in name continued to exist until 1303, but from 1243 until 1303, the state would be exclusively a Mongol tributary state. Uh, in fact, one of the key um, points that, that brings this out is that when Baibars, um, who was the uh, ruler of the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt at the end of the Crusade period um, entered uh, into uh, the Seljuk Sultanate of Rome uh, in two successive invasions. You can see sort of the invasion route uh, in the map in the lower right hand side. The Seljuk uh, Sultans were not themselves actually the ones who led the defense. It was a Persian bureaucrat named Parvane. And Parvane was ordered by Baijun Nayan, the, the Mongol leader, to attack Baibars and put down uh, these revolts, but he stayed neutral as the Mongols fought against Baibars. Baibars was actually able to score incredible victories at Elbistan and Kaisere, but he knew that he wouldn't be able to hold his position in Anatolia, and so he withdrew. But because Parvane refused to attack Baibars, in turn, the Mongols visited their retribution on the Seljuks and burned a number of villages to the ground, as well as removing any possible military power that the Seljuks could ever hope to gain in the future. So this leads us to the Seljuk relations with uh, the Byzantine Empire, because at the same time that Parvane was uh, was trying to avoid engaging with Baibars. Um, the relationship between the um, 
the Byzantines and the Seljuks had changed. In 1261, the Byzantines retook Constantinople and ejected the Francokratia, the, the, uh, the Latin Empire, from Constantinople and retook their territory, meaning that they would now b resume um, their uh, attempts to take back the areas of Anatolia, especially since um, the, uh, the Seljuk Sultanate was weak, uh, they saw that it was their chance. So the Seljuks responded by sending a number of Turkic tribes to the border regions um, between where they were and where the Byzantines were. And one of these leaders was a man by the name of Ertugul of the Kaye tribe. And he, he was sent to the city of Sukhut, which you can see on this map is deep within uh, the empire of Nicaea's area. But um, this map is not exactly from the right time period. So that had become the new border. By putting the Kaye tribe on the border, right, it would defect, it would protect the Seljuk territories deeper within the empire and prevent the Byzantines from making any expansion into Anatolia. Now, we don't know much about Erdogan's actual life. Um, we know only a few things, which left uh, Turkish media producers today a huge opportunity to make a TV show. You can see a picture from the TV show in the center, um, uh, Resurrection Erdogan. And you can see his tomb in the upper right-hand side, uh, showing on the left-hand side the flag of the Kayi tribe, and on the right-hand side the flag of modern Turkey. Erdogan is, in many cases, uh, the symbol of uh, the symbol of uh, honorable war in that he was known as a Ghazi or a Turkish uh, military uh, chieftain. Um, and he was the forerunner of the Ottoman Empire. So one of the things we can notice, right, is that this new empire is based in Sarut, not in Konya. Uh, you can see Konya on this on the map. If you look closely, it's labeled as Iconium, which was the Roman name for it. And it's a far distance away, um, meaning that we're going to see a shift in power away from Konya and towards um, Surut. Uh, Richard, um, yeah. if I could, again, put this into a bit of a European, so the, could you go back? Yeah, the European or sort of Christians. I guess the Latin Empire was basically tied to the Holy Roman Empire at this point. I guess the Holy no. Roman Empire was the center of Latin Christendom. Yes, the term Latin Empire, this, this is one of the problems with naming things. Um, the Latin Empire is a term that we use today to refer to the fact that these were Frankish Christians. They were doing the Latin mass um, who were ruling the territory. It is not connected to the Holy Roman Empire. It was its own autonomous government um, run by Frankish Christians who had come from the West. You can think of it like a crusader state in many ways because okay. that's effectively what it was. Um, and the Byzantines called it Francokratia, right? Ruled by the Franks, uh, which I think is a much better name than, than this Latin empire name, but that's basically what it was. Um, and the Latin empire was slowly defeated through a number of wars led by almost every state that bordered it, right? The empire of Nicaea and the district of Epirus were the two biggest ones, but also Bulgaria fought them on a number of occasions. Um, so we ended up having um, the Latin Empire finally falling when the Empire of Nicaea um, found a secret entrance into the city of Constantinople, so they didn't need to besiege the city. And once they had gotten enough troops in, they were able to overthrow it from the inside out. Does that sort of clarify it? Uh, so, so the Latin Empire is base is sort of linked to the, at least theologically, to the Roman Catholic Church yes. and is part of that split between the Eastern Orthodox Church centered in Constantinople and the Roman Catholic Church. So it's sort of tied, linked to Rome, but very loosely. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's exactly right. It's, it's Catholics who run it, but, you, but again, you can think of it like a crusader state. Um, okay. It's run by local nobles and uh, other individuals. Um, and while they are allied with for example, Venice or Genoa or these other city-states um, in, in modern Italy, um, it's not controlled by anybody from the outside. Thanks. All right. So now, Ertogul's son, Osman, 
began to expand his territory. Now, Osman had an advantage that a lot of Turks, uh, Turkic tribes in Anatolia didn't have. And just for a point, I wanna sort of show you this map, right? This is a map from the wrong time period, but it should give you an idea of how many different tribes were operating, right, in Anatolia. You have all these different groups. And you can see the Ottomans in the Northwest, um, but you also have the Karamanids, you have the the Aydanids, the Eretnids. We're going to uh, we're, uh, we're going to see some of these groups um, as we move uh, through the Ottoman history. But at this point, what's really important to notice is that the Ottomans are one of the few Turkic tribes whose borders are not entirely circumscribed by other Turkic tribes. Right. So you can see if we look at the map that's zoomed in. From, autumn, uh, from Osman's time, you can see that the Byzantine Empire is on his northwest and there are Turkic tribes on his east and south. Where, but because he was bordering the Byzantine Empire on his northwest, it meant that he could conquer areas while not uh, enraging any more powerful, perhaps, uh, Turkic neighbors that he may have had. The first thing that he did was he launched an attack on Karajahisar, um, yeah, uh, on Karajahisar, um, and that castle, um, once it fell, alerted the Byzantines that they needed to deal with this Osman the first, and uh, they attacked him in a place called Bafas. Um, and you can see in the upper left hand side, um, the Byzantines rallying under uh, the flag of the yellow cross, and the Ottomans uh, rallying under uh, the flag, the green flag of Islam. The Battle of Bafas was a significant victory for Osman I, and he was able to defeat uh, the Ottoman forces, sorry, the, the Byzantine forces. The main reason he was able to do so was that he was able to bring in a number of soldiers from a number of different loyalties. So, of course, he had his own Kali tribe, right, that he, that he was ruling over, but he also had um, a number of Turkic mercenaries from other tribes that were willing to fight for him. And he also had a number of Akritai or Byzantine soldiers. And these Akritai had defected to Osman's side and gave him key information and logistics. If you look closely at the picture of the Akritai, you can see it's actually very similar to the Roman legionnaires of centuries past, because of course the Byzantine empire was still Rome. Um, and so a lot of the technology and innovation um, relied on Roman, ancient Roman technologies like, uh, like the, uh, the square shield and the lance. But after winning at the Battle of Bafas, Osman I continued to fight expansionary wars. And this wasn't universally supported among those in his tribe. For example, his uncle Dundar Bey um, disagreed when he tried to invade a small Greek island. And so Osman uh, killed him. He killed his own uncle. We're also going to see that this is a common uh, theme in Ottoman circles, that Ottomans will kill other members of the royal family to secure their power and their throne. Um, so Osman I ended up creating uh, from what was originally a small territory, Sendret Sorut, by his father Erdogan. You can see on the map, it's the dark red area. And he expanded it at the cost primarily of the Byzantine Empire, all the way to the gates of Bursa which at that time was the city of Prusa under the Byzantines. Um, now, because the Byzantines found it so hard to deal with him after the Battle of Bafas, they reached out to European mercenaries. And so the mercenaries they ended up getting were from Catalonia. Um, so you have Roger de Flor, who was a Catalonian knight all the way from Spain. And he arrived at the court of Constantinople. You can see this painting when he was being received by the Byzantine emperor. Now, the cost of these mercenaries ended up bankrupting the Byzantines because instead of bringing a few thousand, a, a few hundred, if not a thousand uh, mercenaries, Roger de Flor brought between 8,000 and 9,000 mercenaries. And he had the, constant, uh, he had the emperor over a barrel in terms of whether or not he would be able to fund all of these uh, soldiers, because otherwise he could just turn them right around and try and sack Constantinople again. Now, when Roger the Floor couldn't, uh, wasn't, was 
being haggled in terms of whether he would get paid or not and how much. And of course, Roger DeFleur's prices were extortionate. So it's not like he was a victim here. Um, he decided that he would take the money from the towns he had, quote, liberated, right? He went to all these Orthodox Christian towns that he had conquered from Osman and uh, his Ottomans. Um, and as soon as he was there, he started plundering the towns. So instead of liberating uh, these Byzantine Christians, he began uh, sacking them, which led to, of course, a negative appraisal of these Latin Christians, right? These, these European Christians. And so the Christians of the uh, Byzantine Empire sort of had to make a decision. Would they want to stand on the side of the Byzantine Empire, um, which was incredibly disorganized? Would they want to stand on the side of the, of the Latin Christians who are plundering their territory? Or would they want to stand on the side of the Ottoman Empire, which while being Muslim, was generally more peaceful towards them? And so you had this sort of acquiescence by many in the region after seeing the way that the Catalans um, dealt with them, uh, that they did not want to be under uh, Catalan rule. Now you can see on the map on the right hand side, um, a number of cities throughout the Byzantine Empire and Anatolia uh, that were plundered by uh, the Catalans when they arrived in those cities. So you can see that it wasn't just a one-off event, it occurred in several different places and really increased the mistrust between the, uh, the Latin Catholics and the Byzantine Orthodox. Now, we mentioned that on his deathbed, um, Osman I uh, began the siege of, of, of Bursa. And we're going to see a few things that are very common in the early Ottoman period. The first one being that the Ottomans are really bad at siege warfare. They do not have siege technologies. They don't understand them to the extent that Osman I had Akritai in his ranks. And we know that uh, one of them uh, was uh, Kuzemihai, Kuzemihal sorry, uh, Michael, uh, Michael the Beardless. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Michael the Bearded, because I'm, 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 I'm um, And even with those Byzantine or former Byzantine soldiers in his military, he didn't have access to siege technology. And so with his soldiers, you can sort of see um, what they would have looked like in the upper right-hand side. Uh, uh, surrounding the city, it took them it took them between seven and nine years, depends on the historical source, uh, to actually receive uh, the surrender of the city of Bursa. There are debates as to whether Osman I was alive when uh, when the siege was finally broken, um, but regardless, he died soon after. And his successor, his eldest son Orhan, um, made Bursa the new capital of this Ottoman state. In terms of the troops that you see on the right-hand side, of course, this is a modern picture, and it's what's called a Mehter Takimi, meaning um, the army marching band. Um, and still today, uh, sorry, until the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, um, this was the typical dress of uh, the military forces um, that were on parade or uh, demonstrating uh, the strength of the Ottoman Empire through, uh, in peaceful times. In war, there were a number of other troops that were involved and they were and of course these troops would be less colorful so during the reign of orhan you begin to see this consolidation of northwest anatolia which is where this map comes from and with these repetitive victories from osman against the Byzantines, you began to have a number of different Turkic mercenaries who would pledge their swords to the ottoman empire um, seeing it as a, a ticket to victory and plunder. And accordingly, the divan or the court of the Sultan began to grow with all of these different Turkic mercenaries. Now, the fact that these Turkic mercenaries joined the Ottoman Empire doesn't mean that they became Ottomans. They still represented their various different factional clans and were only with the Ottomans for so long as the Ottomans kept winning. Um, if the Ottomans were in a weaker position, they would uh, refuse to join them. So, um, yeah, we have, so you begin to have tacit alliances between the Ottomans and several of the groups that surrounded them, especially the Karasids. Okay. 
during the reign of Orhan the first, you can see him in the upper right hand side. Um, we had a massive breakdown in control of the Byzantine Empire. You had a civil war between John V and John VI Cantacuzenos, and both sides bought their own Turkic mercenaries to fight on either side of this Byzantine civil war. Now, many of these Turkic mercenaries were Turkic mercenaries that were aligned with the Ottomans. And during this war, um, Orhan I made sure that he kept careful note of who was winning and what forces were involved and everything that was going on. Towards the end, when Byzantine Empire John VI Cantacuzenos actually won the war, several of these Turkic mercenaries uh, re-swore their allegiance to Orhan I, and when given permission uh, by John VI, they retreated to Gallipoli, which is that peninsula that you can see on the map that um, goes the furthest south on the European side. You can also see the, the sort of blue dot um, in the middle of the peninsula. That blue dot is where there was the historical fortress of Tsimte, of Tsimpe in Greek, Chimpe in Turkish. And this fortress um, was taken by these Turkic mercenaries after they had pledged their loyalty back to Orhan I. That combined with an earthquake, which prevented further Byzantine reinforcements, allowed Orhan I to establish a beachhead on the European side in Gallipoli. Um, that uh, on that peninsula because of the fortress of Tsimpe. Unfortunately, that fortress doesn't survive much. You can see sort of the lower foundation of it uh, at the bottom of the screen. But um, this foothold in Gallipoli meant that the Turks can begin an invasion of Europe because one of the consistent difficulties was crossing, um, uh, crossing the water and making a strong amphibious landing. Turks did not have the kind of mastery of naval control at this point uh, where they could have attempted that. But now with a land territory, and it just took ferrying people from um, areas like Chanakale, you can see on this map, um, to, uh, to Gallipoli over the Dardanelles Strait, um, that was viable and could mean that Turks could begin to expand on the European side. By the time that Orhan died in 1361, he managed to secure the peninsula of Gallipoli and some of the uh, European areas just to the north, meaning that Constantinople was now increasingly surrounded by the Ottomans. As um, when the Turks arrived in What's now, what's now called the region of Thrace. You can sort of see it on the map where the letters LIA of Rumelia uh, are. When the Turks um, got to that area, um, they noticed that there was huge, uh, hugely depopulated uh, areas. And this was because the Black Death had swept through these areas during the mid 1350s. And so there was a lot of open land, which was perfect, of course, for the Sipahi, right? We talked about these Sipahi before. These are the Turkish light cavalry. And so uh, Orhan I um, established that um, these light cavalry um, could become owners of land. And these lands would be called Timar. Um, on the Timar, you would have um, pe local peasants working for uh, the Timariot who would own this land, right? So the Timariot would own the Timar and extract wealth from the men that worked on that land. In return, the, Timari uh, the, the Timariots had to fight in battle when called upon by the Ottoman Sultan. Now, the map I have on the upper left-hand side is from the 19th century, but it, don't, it, but it really clarifies this region that we're going to talk about, which is called Rumelia. Now, Rumelia means little room, right? Because Anatolia was the big room. This is the little room. Um, so Rumelia was the name that the Ottomans gave to this area, which is uh, most of the country of uh, most of the southern part of the country of Bulgaria today, parts of northeastern Greece today, and the westernmost part of Turkey, uh, the part that's on the European side. Now, Rumelia became incredibly important to uh, Orhan and his successors because they built the second capital of the Ottomans. After Bursa, this became the second capital of Edirne, the former city of Adrianople. And you can see, um, yeah, you can see the Selimiye Mosque um, 
in the center. That is the main mosque of Edirne today. Um, and really concretized uh, uh, Ottoman rule in Romelia, right? So now we had Ottomans completely surrounding uh, Constantinople and making incredible inroads against the Balkan powers that surrounded Romania. All right, so when Murad the first uh, comes to power succeeding his father in 1362, sorry, in 1361, he now has all of this territory. You can see the area in dark red was what he inherited from Orhan the first, his father. Um, now, all of these kings that we've been talking about have really long reigns. We're talking, uh, sultans have really long reigns. Uh, we're talking at least 25 years, if not more than that. And so you really have this, these consistent good leaders who've been uh, really able to follow through on long-term objectives. Now, Murad I continued what Osman and Orhan did in that he, he primarily targeted Europeans for his conquests. And there are several reasons for this, but the biggest one was that he wouldn't antagonize Turkic tribes and could get Turkic tribes to align with him in these wars of conquest. In the, 13, uh, in the, in the 1380s, he fought a number of wars in what is today Bulgaria. Um, his biggest victory was, of course, in Sofia, in, which he took in 1385. But similar to Bursa, um, Murad I um, was unable to launch a successful siege of the city. It took him three years for Sophia to surrender because he could not bring any siege engines to the area. And it is also the reason why Nish was not a city that he could hold for very long. You can see it's sort of at the edge of his empire. Uh, Nish is in modern day Serbia. So he spent the majority of his time trying to expand the European frontier and that was his main objective. However, he began to have problems in the East. As we pointed out, Konya was the center uh, of uh, Islamic holiness, and that hadn't changed even though the Sud... Oh. Uh, and that hadn't changed even though um, the Ottomans were now the most powerful Turkic group uh, on the peninsula. So when the Beylik of Karaman um, took Konya, you can see uh, on the map on the left-hand side that Konya is sort of towards the southeastern side of the map, and it's in the territory of the Beylik of Karaman. The Karamanids challenged the Ottomans for what would effectively be the future of Turkish unification. This meant that Murad I had to launch a war against the Beylik of Karaman, and the Karamanids had invaded Ankara, so he had to repulse them there. He fought several engagements against the Karamanids, but as soon as the Karamanids surrendered, he turned and put his forces back into Europe. It was clear that he did not want to antagonize the Turkic groups any more than he had to in order to um, keep them in line and make sure that they would support him, right? Because as we pointed out, as the Ottomans kept winning, more Turkic mercenaries started to join the Ottoman Empire in terms of conquering on its behalf, but they weren't loyal to the empire in terms of its long-term objectives. They were loyal in terms of the booty and loot, and the best place to get that would be from the Europeans. Now, Murad I also begins um, two very uh, sensitive uh, cultural practices let's say, uh, within the Ottoman Empire. He creates what's known as the Janissary Corps, which is an elite infantry division. Um, and the way he begins to recruit for the Janissaries is to try and create a military force which is not loyal in any way to any of these Turkic tribes, right? Because Murad was noticing that if he wanted to ever consolidate his position in Anatolia, he would need a force that was not loyal to any of the particular Turkic sovereigns, because the moment that that particular Beylik was invaded, those Turks could become enemies. So in order to do this, he wanted to recruit Christians for the military, 
But of course, Christians were not allowed to fight for the Ottomans. And it was against Islamic law um, for Christians to bear arms. So the easiest way to resolve this problem was what was called Debshirme, or the forcible enslavement of young Christian children. There, they would be taken to um, Edirne. Uh, eventually, it would become Istanbul when Istanbul became part of the Islamic, uh, became part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and these children would be raised in the court of the Sultan, having exclusive loyalty to the Sultan, and they would be converted to Islam. Now, throughout throughout the period, um, Devshirme was leveled as a tax. So there are those who say that it and it was a way for children really to rise in the world because it allowed them access to power that they wouldn't otherwise have in either the military as janissaries or in the Ottoman bureaucracy. That's, uh, and so there are those who say that Christians in many cases willingly gave their children over to the process of Dibshirme in order to, for their children to have a better life. There were also those who say that, that this was a human rights abuse, splitting children from their parents and indoctrinating them in beliefs their parents did not have. Regardless, uh, this resulted in the creation of the Janissary Corps, which from this point onward becomes almost more famous than the Sipahi and the Akinji, which are the two um, light cavalry divisions that the Turks would field in battle. The Janissaries, as time will go on, will also have more of a political role, but at this point, they are exclusively a military contingent. The last battle that Murad I fought, in fact, he died in this battle, was the Battle of Kosovo of 1389. Uh, up until this point, Serbia had been the strongest opposition to uh, further uh, Ottoman expansion into the Baltic region. But after uh, the death of Stefan Dushan, who had been there, uh, who had been their very successful king, um, Prince Lazar was less capable of holding back the Ottomans. The Ottomans chose the fields of Kosovo as the point of their engagement. And you can see a painting depicting a Prince Lazar um, with his sword up in the center, um, fighting against uh, the Ottoman forces. Uh, you can see coming from the right-hand side of the picture. Now, there are Serbian myths about how the battle went down. Historians have not weighed in whether those are true or not. We don't have enough evidence to say either way. Uh, the Serbian story is that uh, a daring uh, Serbian named Miloš Obilić, um, al along with a number of uh, his Ser uh, Serbians, uh, snuck into the Ottoman camp and assassinated uh, Murad I in his tent. Um, Miloš being the one who killed uh, Murad I, and Murad the first son, Bayezid the first, uh, told everybody not to tell the Ottoman troops uh, that uh, that the Sultan was dead in order to prevent them from being demoralized. And uh, Bayezid the first, who you can see in the picture uh, with his sword, he's the one in sort of the red Ottoman uh, suit. Um, con uh, Bayezid the first yielded him. Uh, Bayezid the first lightning bolt is confronting Prince Lazar uh, on the battlefield. And uh, this was a stunning victory for the Ottomans. And only after the battle uh, did Bayezid re uh, admit that Murad I was dead and build uh, in that spot in Kosovo um, a turbe, right, uh, a memorial a tomb for Murad I. You can see that memorial tomb uh, in the bottom. Uh, it's called Meshedi, uh, sorry, Meshedi Hudavendigar. Uh, Hudavendigar is a Turkish rendering of Hudavendigar which is a Persian meaning uh, blessed by God. And that was the epithet that Murad the first had carried during his life. And Meshhad um, means uh, martyrdom. So it was the, uh, it was the, turb, it was the uh, tomb of the martyr uh, blessed by God, right? Uh, so that brought Murad the first reign to an end and it was inherited by his son Bayezid the first who we're going to talk about more um, in two weeks. But to sort of, sum up where we've been with these first three Ottoman sultans who've taken us from 1299 into 1389. So 90 years we've covered just now. Um, we started from that very small territory that Erdogan controlled outside of Zerud and Osman I expanded it at the cost of the Byzantine Empire. Um, so did Orhan and so did Murad I. 
in each case building the empire in terms of significant amounts of territory and wealth. We also mentioned how Murad I, by conquering Rumelia, was able to bring a lot of Turkic soldiers there and settle them as Timariot, these landholders um, that would have an incredible amount of wealth from the peasants on their land. Um, I have a comment that uh, wasn't even as late as 16th, 17th century that one of these children um, was basically the PM foreign minister and big proponent of the Ottoman regime. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of leaders in the late Ottoman period were, um, were people who had come through either the Deb Shirme system or the Janissaries. Uh, the Janissaries themselves really stopped in the, uh, I want to say, uh, early 19th century. It might have been a little earlier than that as well um, because of revolts against them uh, by the Ottomans, uh, by the Ottoman sultans. They wanted to remove them um, because they were against creating a modern army. Um, and they were installing their own sultans, so the sultans wanted more power against them. Richard, but, quick question. Yeah, yeah. Was there a, was there a Janissary instrumental uh, musical band, uh, so to speak, um, that you know of, uh, not... like to to instill fear in uh, in en enemies, like kind of um, like a Turkish theme? Um... I'm not a, I'm not aware of such a thing. But the Janissaries had very distinctive uniforms. And in all of the engagements that we've seen from Murad I, the Janissaries would be in a central column, um, right? Uh, like they would take the high ground and they were, and in addition to being good with, with a sword, they were also good with a bow and arrow. And that was actually their chief method of attack was bow and arrow or crossbow. Um, they would occupy the high ground. And after the Akinja and Sepahi, the light cavalry uh, had funneled uh, their enemy into sort of a box, um, the Janissaries would take them down. And so they had a very legendary status, both in the Ottoman military and in the militaries of those who opposed them. So we covered, we covered a lot of time today. Um, we covered from the beginning, basically, of the 13th century uh, to basically the end of the 14th century. So, uh, so an incredible amount of time where you had a lot of demographic shifts, a lot of ideological shifts, religious shifts, um, and of course, political shifts. So um, any, any sort of questions before we sort of close out? No, uh, you were saying hiring mercenaries and we know, and I know you're gonna come to that, but uh, not in this lecture where, uh, you know, we were talking about this fam famous mercenary, uh, Antoniani, whatever his name is, that, that defended Genovese, that defended the uh, um, uh, Constantinople uh, against the Murat II. But um, how effective were the mercenaries? Uh, were they effective at all? I know he was really, Giovanni was very effective against Murat II. I, 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 I... I, I can't speak to the European mercenaries. When I'm talking about the mercenaries here, I'm talking about Turkic mercenaries, right? So, so basically you have all these tribes in Anatolia. Some of them have dominions, some of them do not. Um, and those who do not um, live generally on the Ekta, right? We've talked about Ekta before, these parceled lands. And so you had Turkic groups who were there, but at the same time, if they had an offer for participation in battle, um, they knew that they could recover, recover booty from that battle. And so that is how they would be paid. They would be paid that way. Um, and so their loyalty was to the money, not to the Ottoman project, right? If the Ottomans, if the Ottomans fail militarily, um, these mercenaries lose economically, and then they're going to ignore the Ottomans. Right. You also had mentioned, I remember in our last lecture, during the uh, uh, fight between Timur and Bayezid, there was a Serbian uh, squad that yes. held their own. So yeah. can you talk about a little bit of the relationship between, and we also know Murad's, you can even think of her like a stepmom, you can think of it, that supported him through, and also was his spy, um, also helped him a lot. Uh, Murad the second yeah. I meant. I, I mean, it's, so, it's, something that, it's something that we're gonna talk about a lot more in two weeks when we reconvene, but basically after the Serbians were defeated at the Battle of Kosovo, um, 
Stefan Lazarevich, uh, Prince Lazar's son, uh, Stefan Lazarevich, basically becomes an, on, an honored vassal of, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so you ended up like, uh, like you can see on this map of Murad I, you can see that Serbia, Bulgaria, and Constantinople were all paying tribute to the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so as part of that tribute, Stefan Lazarevich was required to bring a Serbian battle corps uh, with him into battle. Um, whenever the Ottomans called upon him uh, for a war of conquest, and one uh, or or just a general battle in any case, and so when Sultan Bayezid Yildirim uh, marched on Ankara in 1402 to defend it from uh, the Timurids, uh, sorry, from Timur, um, the Serbians were part of that battle, and unlike the Turkic mercenaries who, when they realized that the Be that Bayezid was not going to win. Uh, they deserted, uh, the Serbians fought to the end. Um, so um, they were very well received by the Ottoman leadership because of how strongly they had fought. That, of course, doesn't change the fact that Serbia would repeatedly rebel uh, and fight for independence uh, periodically throughout the Ottoman period, finally getting their independence in the 1830s. Uh, Richard, in, in that Balkan area, to what extent were the, did the Balkan areas become Turkish speaking at all? I guess some of them were converted to Islam. To what extent were they, uh, did they speak Turkish or, and become uh, Muslims? Um, th this is obviously a hugely controversial subject um, with a lot of people conjecturing different ways. Um, what I can say with certainty is the following. When the first Bulgarian census was conducted, um, roughly one in six people within the borders of Bulgaria were what were called Pomaks, who were Turkic speaking people, whether they were Slavs or Turkish ethnically. Um, today, that fraction is down to about one seventh or one eighth. Um, in other areas of the Balkans, you had huge Muslim populations that would develop over the centuries. Um, during this period, you have to remember that the Black Death had cleared out a lot of the population that had existed in this region. So we're talking about maybe 50% of the people who would have been there in the 1320s were not there when Orhan took it in 1361 uh, and Murad took it in the 1370s. So um, when the Timariot came, they were a minority, but they were a, an empowered minority. Right? They were the ones who were able to order the local population to farm their lands and um, to provide uh, them with money and wealth. Um, so Turkish became the dominant language of commerce. And so most people were speaking it probably by the beginning of the 1400s, even if Turkish wasn't their native language. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you ended up having conversions throughout the region. Um, there's a reason why, for example, Bosnia right today has 50% uh, Muslim population. Uh, Albania is about the same, um, split between the Sunnis and the Bektashis. Um, so there, and those are places where we know that Muslims were not expelled, right? During the 1800s, we have a lot of Islamic expulsions. We're gonna talk about that when we get to the 1800s. Um, but, there were certain, there was certainly a sizable Muslim population um, there. It was certain uh, during this period, it would have been a minority, but it would have been sizable, maybe 20%, 30%. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Some uh, moments, Rich, very common. Yeah. It's very complicated. Uh, Richard, I want to thank you again. This was really, really good. Uh, and I apologize for the you know, technical difficulty on my end. Uh, sorry about that. But um, again, thank you. This was really great. Just want to go over the, if anybody has any, any other questions, I could just stop for a second and then you can ask questions or we can read some stuff before. No, okay. Well, Tom, Rama saying thank you. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I also wanted to sort of give a roadmap for where we're going in the future. Um, okay. So we're, we're taking off next week because it's Thanksgiving. Um, the next two weeks, um, I have scheduled the presentations. Um, so that would be November 30th, where we're going to talk about um, the Ottoman growing pains, which were problems um, associated with the growth 
under the next succession of rulers. Um, then uh, on December 7th, we're going to talk about Mehmed the, uh, Mehmed the second, uh, known as the conqueror, mm -hmm. right? The one who takes Constantinople. Um, and so that'll primarily be about him as well as his son, Bayezid the, uh, Bayezid the second. Um, and I haven't scheduled it yet. I'll send Zach the information soon uh, for December 14th, which will be uh, Selim and Suleiman, um, talking about really the height and glory uh, days of the Ottoman Empire. After that point, starting in January, and we're going to take a break of two weeks for the holiday season. And then starting in January, um, I think the, the, the best course of action would be to just follow the Ottoman Empire through its decline. Um, but if there are um, other stories uh, that people want to talk about or want to reach, please tell me, um, at, because I'm still trying to put together uh, that curriculum. And I would be more than happy to integrate if you want to talk about Persia in this time period or Egypt in this time period or whatever, um, to sort of create a more well-rounded story of the development um, from the 1500s onward. So, um, yeah, uh, that's... Uh, uh, Richard, Richard, Richard again, could, I, could, could I ask a, uh, one more question? What is it that distinguished the Ottoman people from the other Turkish people, the Karamanids and, and others? Were there language differences? Were there differences in their, their Islam? Um, um, to the extent that there were linguistic differences, they uh, exist on a dialect continuum, right? Um, it's not like Ottomans couldn't understand Karamans uh, or Karamans couldn't understand white sheep Turks or any of these other combinations, right? It, that's that's not what the situation was. Um, so the the main uh, difference was tribal orientation, right? Turks were very tribal, um, and so uh, you had loyalty to your tribe. That's that's basically what it came down to. Uh, in terms of different Islams, we've sort of talked about right that sort of distinction throughout. Uh, that sort of distinction throughout uh, the Anatolia between people who were more Sunni oriented, legalistically speaking, those who are more um, Sufi oriented, uh, Sufi oriented, those who are more um, Bakteshi or Alevi in their orientation, right? Um, you have a lot of these different groups, but none of the empires is fighting like for the Alevis or for the Sunnis or that, that was never the, the difference. It was just tribal organizations and the Bays of Karaman considered themselves more traditional than the Ottomans. The Ottomans were considered more innovative. Wow. Well, in very good. Their, thanks. Very yeah. good. Very Which, good. Excellent uh, presentation. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Richard, uh, one thing, if you can integrate, if it's possible, to maybe throw Azeri and Armenian, uh, you know, participation within the Ottoman Empire. And I know, you know, what I'm trying to lead is, you know, I wanted to see where, how did it lead to the, that 20th century genocidal behavior? Sure. And, um, uh, you know, sure. I, can, I, I can tell you, I can tell you right now that the Armenian presence in the Ottoman Empire is absolutely something I, I was planning to cover. Um, the uh, Azeri are much more involved in the Safavid Empire, um, which is the rival of the Ottomans. So um, what might be what might be worthwhile uh, after I do that presentation on uh, Selim and Suleiman for the first presentation of 2022 uh, to be on the Safavid Empire, because that will sort of color um, where Azerbaijan comes from and what the Azeri people, um, how they sort of approached um, creating their own Persian empire. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, I, I didn't know that there's, you know, within Iran, there is a, a Zeri part. I mean, I even call it, what is it, Northern Azerbaijan? Or yeah, Northern no, well, Azeri that or... was that, that was the original Azerbaijan. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. The, the region of Iran was called Azerbaijan up to the Aras River. The Aras River is what separates what used to be Soviet Union from what is Iran, right? Um, right. The area north of the Aras River was called Albania, right? Um, it eventually got the name Azerbaijan um, because of its cultural changes in line with uh, Iranian Azerbaijan. Um, so that's that's where that name comes from. Yeah. Thank you, Richard, again. This was an incredible presentation and uh, as usual, and thank you for keeping us 
more and more and more interested in this, uh, you know, so complicated world, so to speak. And we were like mesmerized and listening to you. And I, I was just like kept you captivated. And I just thank wanted to you. go over this. No, thank you. I just wanted to go over the schedule this week. Tomorrow, we're doing uh, our brother, uh, Narul and Sabil uh, are doing the Women in Islam. Uh, as we know, uh, there is a lot of controversy, you know, toward the fact that how the women are treated according to Quran. So tomorrow is going to be maybe some questions you can ask. Maybe it's going to be, it's going to raise more questions. I don't know, but it's interesting. We are over a hundred people that visiting us tomorrow from the uh, um, Roberts group. Uh, and then Saturday we have Paul uh, talking about the uh, third uh, war with some nights and expansion in Rome. Um, you know, we're, it's a Rome, Roman uh, theme. And then uh, Sunday, uh, we have Alex C, who is going to be presenting first time. Uh, she's going to be talking about the archaeology in Asia, particularly mostly interested in non-Chinese archaeology. And maybe she'll touch on some of the Chinese archaeology. I still haven't seen the presentation yet. So, um, you know, and then we have a bunch of stuff, you know, next week, uh, which is one of them, you know, we will talk about stoicism, meditation by uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius, you know, uh, for anybody interested, and I'm particularly looking for contributors. Um, you know, please come and you know talk about what do you know about stoicism and stuff. This is going to be a discussion. But we're going to discuss meditation, though, um, and uh, you know stuff like that. So, uh, and then we'll talk about Roman uh, legions and stuff like that next week. But uh, we have a lot of present, good, very good presentations coming up, and. Um, and then also on the 28th, if anybody interested, you know, we don't particularly have a lot of seats in the Marivan restaurant, only nine, but I think one person or two people dropped out. Uh, we can go to the, at least Ukrainian restaurant, even if we're not going to a restaurant, whoever is not be able to visit a restaurant, but at least we can go to the Ukrainian museum and check out the Ukrainian museum and uh, talk a little bit about Ukrainian culture. Everything is going on right now with um, DNR, LNR, which is, you know, in, in Russia, and I'll maybe touch on a little bit of conflict between Ukraine and, and Russia stemming from, you know, uh, historical, uh, um, you know, a historical conflict between them. And um, what, uh, what is he saying? <laughs> I should go over one on the museum. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, so I do want to want to say and point out that um we will create a travel group so we're, our first travel presumably is in the summer of 2022 and we're going to uzbekistan so to, do let me know what your preferences are richard and you know, i obviously i'm originally from there but richard has been there recently but if you guys want you know let me know who wants to maybe make uh, so i can start making roadways and then i will make it really interesting we will probably book um, like a village tour where we can live one day in a village and then maybe visit a wedding or something. And we will tape all that, you know, we'll go to the, you know, three cities uh, and we can determine whether you want to go to the modern city, Tashkent, and then visit uh, Bukhara and Samarkand, or we can go to all ancient cities, which is Bukhara, Samarkand, Hiva. Uh, those usually just- Let's uh, say from, from a travel perspective, if you are an American citizen, um, travel to Uzbekistan, at least pre-COVID, um, was very easy. Um, you ha like you have to fill in a, a small questionnaire and get a small uh, a small electronic visa uh, before you go. You just go to the Uzbek website and it costs like ten dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. Uh, there's no uh, there's no embassy procedure. There's no uh, invasive requirements. No agency you have to hire. It's very easy to do. So. Um, if, for those who are afraid of traveling because of the diplomatic difficulties, that's not an issue with Uzbekistan. No, right there uh, with uh, President Mirzoyev, they opened up and uh, actually everything is extremely cheap and we can really have a lot of fun and enjoy historical um, areas. And um, we'll, you know, we'll get a lot of food, we'll go to a bazaar, which is a Uzbekistani market and it's gonna be really a lot of fun. I mean, we'll hire a bus to take us to places and you know it would be, it would be really like you know 
maybe a 10 day tour and it'd be really awesome. We'll see. I'm, I'm still organizing, still in the process, you know, with COVID, everything's going on, but um, thanks everybody. Richard, thank you again. This was incredible. And I hope you guys join us. One of the presentations this week, next week, whenever, and I hope we'll see each other in person as well. I mean, I'm trying to organize the new year's bash on the 19th or 18th, actually 18th. I'm sorry. And I want to do it in a restaurant called Svetlana, which is in the city. It's actually a Russian uh, Jewish restaurant. It's, you know, it's really, I just want to see everybody from a New York group and kind of like talk and get some food and, and uh, just enjoy the year, you know, or not enjoy or whatever, you know, celebrate the year, <laughs> bad, bad choice of words. And again, thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank you, Richard. Good job, Richard. Bye. Bye. Zach. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot, Richard and Zach. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye.